Hi, podcast listeners. Welcome to the A World of Difference podcast. We have so many guests on this show making a difference in our lives, making a difference all around the world with the expertise that they bring. And yet so many of you are reaching out to me saying, you want more. It's not enough just what we're putting on these podcast episodes for you. And so I am here to extend a very warm welcome to you to our Difference Maker community where you can join for as little as $5 a month to get all this extra content out the gate, you're going to get 30 plus mini sods of exclusive content not available for the regular podcast listeners and an exclusive mini sode every month. And you'll get exclusive voting power to help us pick podcast topics and more. And that's with our changers tier. There's three different main tiers and then an extra uh, larger tier. But whatever tier that you join at, you will be included in this extra content and I know that many of you are wanting to go a little bit deeper. And so even though it gets a little wild in there sometimes because of how deep we go, I want you to join us there. This extra content is very special. It means a great deal to me to be a part of this community with you. And I would love to just exchange uh, ideas or perspectives that you have around these different episodes. And that's the place where we do it. So please show up to our Difference Maker community. Give us $5 out of your pocket every month. And I think that you'll have a lot of fun in there because we do. And I would love for you to join us. So go to patreon.com slash a world of difference to join us there. Welcome to the A World of Difference podcast. I'm Lori Adams Brown, and this is a podcast for those who are different and want to make a difference. Our guest on today's show is Dorothy Little Greco, and she is a writer and a speaker and a marriage coach that many of you have already heard about because she's the author of a couple of really great books out there called Making Marriage Beautiful that she wrote in 2017, and then her latest book, Marriage in the Middle, which released in September of 2020. Her writing, though, has appeared everywhere. Christianity Today, Missio Alliance, she's written for Mops, Relevant Magazine, Propel Women, so many other publications. She's also, interestingly enough, a photographer, a professional photojournalist, in fact, and her writing, her phot photography has been in National Geographic, all kinds of publications. But when she's not writing or making photographs, Dorothy and her husband, Christopher, love to kayak and take long walks and see theater. She's just such a well-rounded person. Uh, she comes onto the show today because in our Restore series, we're talking about marriage and egalitarianism. And many of you are curious about how that all works if you have been raised and been swimming in the ocean of complementarianism. So I'm happy to introduce to you today, if you've not heard of her before, Dorothy Little Greco. Hello, welcome Dorothy Latell Greco to the A World of Difference podcast. I'm so excited to have you on today. How are you doing? I'm doing great and thank you for having me on the show. Of course. Thank you for sending me two of your books on marriage. We're going to ask some questions about that for our listeners all around the world from all different cultures and types of marriages, religious backgrounds. We're going to talk today about what it looks like to have a marriage where it's more egalitarian and experiencing more mutuality, mm -hmm. which is a, a bit of a conversation going on in the Twitter sphere and different places around. And so thanks for coming on. I wanted to give you a chance just here at the beginning, Dorothy, to Tell us a little bit about yourself and about your background. Sure. So I am now over 60. Christopher and I have been married for 31 years. We have three sons, 29, 26, and 23. We live outside of Boston, Mass. We love to kayak together. We love to feed people. We love to talk about theology. And when we're sitting down with people, the topic of conversation tends to be very practical, very focused on marriage, very focused on how we're really doing, you know, going deep. Um, I also work as a photographer that has been part of my professional life for, I guess, 37 years now. Yeah. So that's a brief, brief snippet about me. I love it. I could tell that you're the kind of person that goes deep in conversation by reading your books. And I love it so much. I feel like I would enjoy kayaking or sitting down and having some food and talking with you and your husband. It'd be a, a, a nice treat for Jason and I to get to do that. Um, but I, I also want to ask this question because mm -hmm. some people are more of like, let's just have the conversation. But others like you want to really write it down 
for other people to have as a resource. I'd love to know why it was that you wrote each of these books. And maybe those are two separate questions. Why did you write your first book about marriage and then your other one about um, kind of midlife and marriage? Sure. I think that there are multiple motivations. One is that Christopher and I are really, really different people. And we had a lot of conflict, for, particularly in the first 10 years of our marriage. So we've had to work really hard. It's not been one of those marriages where we've just come together and it's all been super easy. And every day is just, uh, you know, so fun. Um, it's been a lot of hard work. And I don't think, you know, obviously our story is unique, but I don't think we're alone. So because we have done pastoral care in churches in the Boston area for the past 30 years, we really have our fingers on the pulse of what other couples are dealing with. And in particular, before I wrote the first book, Making Marriage Beautiful, three of our close friends who had all been married more than 25 years, who all had kids, who were all faith-filled believers, their marriage is just completely unraveled in a very short period of time. And you know, when a marriage fails, it doesn't simply impact the family, it impacts the community. And yeah. I think that we were actually a little bit shaken when when this happened to have three, you know, three of them in, in the same season all unravel. It really caused us to um, re-up our commitment to each other, to be more intentional, to um, talk more, to do more check-ins, just to make sure that we weren't getting lazy, because I think that that can be the, the tendency maybe in midlife. Um, so that motivated us to say, how are we doing, but also how can we serve couples around us? And then for the second book, Marriage in the Middle, you know, because I'm the age that I am, uh, there are a lot of really unique challenges and losses and shifting that happens during the 40 to 65 time period. You know, our kids, if our parents, our kids move out, our parents tend to die during that period. Um, we might have some professional challenges that we didn't anticipate happening. Our bodies are changing in ways that can feel out of control. So all of those things can conspire to pull us apart rather than help us to connect better. So I just wanted to sort of flag, hey, these are some of the things that are going to happen in midlife. Be prepared, but also to offer real hope and practical suggestions for folks so that they have some tools and resources as they go through this time period. Such a gift, both of these books, whether you're um, experiencing midlife already or not, it's a good book to prepare, um, but also your first book just for, for all kinds of marriages. And yeah. um, and so I, I get this question a lot doing, having, you know, worked as a pastor and then been in ministry for, you know, well over 20 years until I switched into business. But even now that I work in business, I still have people asking me this question. Um, what is good marriage advice that you yourself would give to an engaged couple who's embarking upon marriage in the next year or so? Um, 2022 has brought a lot of changes in the last couple of years, and there have been some significant challenges. Gen Z, a lot of them are starting to get married, um, as well as some of the younger millennials are still in that category. And so, yeah, what's your best advice for an engaged couple right now? Oh, there's so much I could say. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> I guess uh, don't rush in, you know, make sure even before you make the commitment to be married that you really are ready. And, you know, we're never 100 percent ready, just like we're never 100 percent ready to have kids. Right. We're ready enough. Um, but I think that culture can tend to pressure maybe Christian culture in particular can pressure people towards marriage. And I think that we really need to be sure that we have the resources and that we are ready. And one of the things that we often talk about with couples, if there are any ongoing addictions, like those, you need to have sobriety before you get married. Because if you yeah. think that by getting married, you're going to get sober, you're going to be so disappointed and it's going to be so much more difficult. So um, full disclosure, anything that's going on in terms of addictions needs to be talked about and dealt with. And we would advocate sobriety for at least six months before getting married. Um Asking friends who, who know both of you to weigh in and to say, what do you see? Where do you see potential conflicts happening? Sometimes for some people doing, you know, the Myers-Briggs or the various personality tests will allow you to see potential areas of conflict. So when Christopher and I did premarital, we were as opposite as you could possibly be on the Myers-Briggs. And when our pastor sat down with us, I had a very vivid picture. We were on his couch in his living room. He actually grabbed both of our hands and said, 
okay, I have some news for you. <laughs> and obviously, you know, we don't want to be boxed in by personality tests. It's not like they tell us who we need to be. There's a much bigger life out there than whatever letters or numbers you are. But knowing those things, I think, can help us understand what might be going on in certain areas of conflict. Um, and the other thing that I would say is absolutely positively do some form of premarital before you go into marriage, because oftentimes the couples who struggle the most are the ones who didn't do any premarital counseling. Yes, that is so true. And personalities, you know, interact in very different ways. And I get sometimes people will ask, like, should I only look for certain personality types? Or what if, you know, what if we have the two that they always say is the most incompatible? And I think for the most part, your books give us really great insight into it doesn't matter what your personality type is. There's some skills that all of us can bring. And so that is really good advice. And I think addiction is a really important warning um, Mm -hmm. because um, in my, my husband's a marriage and family therapist and he did his practicum and internship years ago in a a substance abuse center. And he and I both learned a lot through that experience about what it means to experience addiction and whether it's substance abuse or other types of abuse, Mm -hmm. like a pornography addiction. Um, There's so many kinds of addictions out there, food addictions, which are their own unique thing. So much of it, um, it really does. You bring that into marriage and then it really can super affect a marriage early on, especially. So that's really great advice because um, we have great friends in our lives that are sober, have been for years, um, or have basically are in recovery from their Mm -hmm. addiction. And they are some of the greatest people to be around, honestly, because they're just so aware of the need they have, especially those who follow God and God has been a part of that journey. Um, so their dependence, their utter dependence on God is very special and having just been somewhat invited, like as an outsider into groups that are in recovery and helping one another, there's just some very special sacred moments that we have shared with people. And so it is just, I just also want to echo what you're saying, anybody who's struggling with addiction to find a recovery group and to really do that first, because it it will just set you up in a whole different way for marriage. I really appreciate you saying that. And if you have, you know, any mental health issues, if you're Mm -hmm. depressed, like don't hide that. Don't think like, Oh, I have to pretend that I'm actually not depressed. Like you want to deal with these things as much as possible ahead of time and communicate with your to be spouse what's going on so that they're not, you know, shocked when they get into marriage and realize, Oh my gosh, like my spouse is significantly depressed. Good advice. Yes. And we're seeing, I mean, one of the characteristics they're saying about Gen Z is the high anxiety levels Mm -hmm. that are different from other generations. And, um, you know, I think our society is going to be doing a lot of shifting to help. I hope we do to help care for the well-being of Gen Z. I mean, I've even noticed I have, you know, twins that just started high school and they were trying to figure out because they're all their friends are talking about like, is are they having mental health days? What if somebody has like a really bad day? And it was right. like, you know, they were kind of shocked, like they don't have mental health days here. And it's like, I was like, well, you know, honestly, I had never heard of mental health days until Gen Z. So mm-hmm. I'm grateful that you guys are bringing those out. I think it's wonderful. We do need to add that into our society, but this may shock you. We don't even really know what those are, you know? <laughs> so, um, but I think Gen Z is really pushing us to have this conversation, which I'm really grateful for. And yes. I hope that they will help us all in our marriages to, have these conversations because they are so, so important in our marriages and our workplaces and our faith-based spaces. Um, But that's really great advice just to be forthcoming about what you're struggling with, to be vulnerable and be honest. That can Mm -hmm. be really scary. Um, How do you advise people to sort of go about that? Because I know, um, you know, in dating, you know, it's been a long time since either one of us have dated. So I don't know what it's like nowadays, but at least back when we were probably dating, it was you know, you don't really show everything on the first date because it can be overwhelming. And so how do you advise people to kind of come out with that conversation? And at what point would it be appropriate to probably do so? Yeah. And, you know, the the crazy thing is that in our culture, there's so much disclosure, but it's not always vulnerable and it's not always appropriate, right? Social media, Mm -hmm. there are times when I see things that people post and I just, you know, I feel aghast that they chose that space to share that particular thing. Um, 
So I think it's a strange time for us to really choose honesty and vulnerability in a way that's authentic and in a way that builds relationship rather than in a way that builds likes or builds numbers, because those are not the same thing, right? Okay. So for Christopher and I, we have always felt that confession is an enormously important component of marriage and of, of how we express our faith. So we have regular confession of sins to each other. And it's not, you know, so oftentimes I think people... I don't know, understand confession as something that we do out there. You know, the Catholics are actually much better at it than the Protestants because it's a regular part of how they practice their faith. But we might assume that it's only for those times when we have like a big moral failure um, that then we need to disclose that. But for us, what has helped us to grow and what has helped us to move towards honesty with each other is simply at the end of the day, Um, You know, just having a moment of reflection where was there anything that I did or said today that was hurtful? Were there any sins? And when I say sins, I mean places where I hurt other people or where where I harbored judgment or criticism towards someone. Um, And to just turn to one another in bed and to say, hey, you know, I was really kind of rude with you at dinner tonight. And I'm really sorry about that. Um, Here's what was going on. That's not an excuse. But just so you know, the backstory Uh, I just want to apologize for that. Those little moments of confession, I think, really build transparency. They build honesty. They build trust with with each other. And that really helps us to have marriages that can thrive when there's an ever-deepening trust. In terms of how to have those conversations, you know, we have to set time aside. It can't be something on the fly. It cannot, please, like, please, please, please don't text these kind of things to each other. Like make sure you're sitting down in the same room face to face, set up a time. Hey, there's some things that I think it would be helpful for us to talk about uh, before we enter into marriage. And, you know, if they're really big things, then we have to be able to give the other person the space to experience what we've just disclosed. Um, If it's something really enormous, hey, I have an ongoing pornography addiction, we can't expect the other person to think like, oh, great, thank you for sharing that with me. Oh, I totally forgive you. Move on. Yeah. (laughs) There's going to be some grief. There's going to be surprise. There might be anger. So, you know, we have to be ready to to receive the significant Mm -hmm. other's feedback and experience of that confession. But we really do believe that a regular form of confession for everything, again, you know, thoughts actions, et cetera, really does help us to move into a a better and healthier space. So, so good. Yes. I love that. And I remember when I read that in your book, like you were talking about, sometimes it might just be like, you know, little lies that you were saying that you just think, oh, we all, we all kind of say something to make someone feel better. But honestly, you know what I mean? Like even those are sinful. And the thing about marriage is if we're doing it well, it's helping all of our relationships. Mm -hmm. It's helping us, you know, grow to be for those of us who follow Jesus, to be more like Christ. It's helping us with our own sanctification and our own discipleship. Um, But yeah, harboring sin, like that is just something I think in the American church in general is such a huge issue. And if we can do a better job in our marriages, it'll just help our entire faith communities as we (laughs) go forward. It's such such good advice. You know, the witness of the church. I mean, if you look at what's Mm -hmm. happening across the American church in the past 10 years, it's kind of staggering. I mean, it feels like it's a who's who of, Um, You know, these top leaders who have sinned egregiously and a large part of that is keeping it hidden. Right. So we don't want to hide our sins. We want to be honest about what's going on in our lives because that's the only way we're going to get whole. Yes, totally. Absolutely agree. Could not agree more. It's just it's huge. And um, yeah, it's it's interesting because I think with some of the things you mentioned, image management and social media and being a different person out there than you are, you know, on the inside is so huge right now. And even outside of faith-based spaces, I don't know if you saw the New York Times article that was kind of all over Twitter last um, Friday, where there's this guy, Dan Price, who was big on LinkedIn and on Twitter, and he has this big company up in Seattle. And he basically was, you know, trying to talk about being a good boss and caring about poverty and all these different things while he had been assaulting women and and grooming them over Instagram. And so there was a woman here in California that has a case of assault against him. There's a woman up in Seattle and he has an ex-wife that had spoken out, but had her Ted talk canceled. And now they're putting it back on because they they thought she was lying. So it's crazy how you can have an image that's so opposite of the person who they actually are. The thing is in marriage though, you can't really, you can hide things. Of course, we know these stories, 
But over time, the truth comes out. It really does. And so I agree with what you said. Keeping things in the dark, it only festers and gets worse. Bringing it to the light and the sunshine can help things heal and help things flourish. And that's really what your books are about. So I have this, I have this one question for you. Sure. Um, a lot of people listening are, um, not everyone, everybody's very diverse that listens to the world of different podcasts from different walks of life and places they live. But we have quite a few people who've probably been in a very, what we call complementarian theological world in mm-hmm. Southern Baptist world. Um, not everybody is that way. I certainly wasn't and neither were um, my in-laws and my my parents aren't like this, but a lot of people have had these complementarian marriages or theology of you know mm-hmm. women in general, and there aren't many books out there for people in the pews about mm-hmm. egalitarian marriage. A lot of it's much more academic um, over the last many years, um, and so a lot of people probably have this question: How is a marriage that is egalitarian or practices mutuality different from a complementarian marriage? In your perspective. I mean, it doesn't have to be different, right? Because I think that there can be overlap between the two. And I, I don't think that those two things have to be binary. Um, and also just to note that it, it can be very easy to oversimplify this conversation. So I want to say that, you know, I may not nail this. I do talk about it a fair amount in uh, both books and in, uh, in much of my other writing. But I think in its purest form, a complementarian marriage Um, is rooted in the reality that men and women are created different by design and that those differences are meant to complement each other. And and I absolutely totally agree with that. Where it can get problematic, at least for me, is when there's a rigidity and who does what in gender roles. And it's more of a culturally informed versus scripturally informed, like that culture tells us what things should be. And then we somehow believe that actually, no, that's scripture. Um, So, for example, you know, some complementarian Christian couples might espouse that the men go off to work and that the women stay home and raise the children and homeschool them. Now, we homeschooled for 10 years, so I'm by by no means opposed to homeschooling. But the idea that the wife or that the woman has to remain at home and that her focus, all of her creativity should go towards her children and for homeschooling is really culturally prescribed. That is not in Scripture. If you look historically Prior to, I don't know, 1600s, 1500s, somewhere in there, when we as a a world moved from an agrarian culture to a commerce-based culture, everybody in the family worked, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Shoulder to shoulder, out in the field, at the craftsman bench, the kids, as soon as they were old enough to do something useful, were were asked to do it. So um, the notion that this is what it means to be a Christian wife, this is what it means to be a Christian husband... I think it's very easy for us to take the cultural norms and to apply them to um, the scripture as opposed to the other way around, right? And in terms of spiritual roles, I think that for many complementarian couples, they look at passages like, uh, sorry, I'm blanking, 1 Corinthians 11, you know, Mm -hmm. where, and it also can feel like that the husband is sort of at the top of the hierarchy. He's somehow closer to God and therefore has more authority and influence. And I think a couple who hopes to create an egalitarian marriage um, tends to work towards mutuality in eliminating hierarchies. Like they don't want to say this is what it's supposed to be like. They want to believe that the, you know, the the saying the ground is level at the foot of the cross. Right. So in a complementarian marriage, maybe um, the wife might weigh in on important matters, but ultimately just defers to the husband to make the important decisions. And in, in an egalitarian marriage, There's more of a commitment to understand where each person is coming from, to value each other's perspective, and to come to a um, decision together. So there was this story just comes to mind as I'm talking. uh, Christopher and I were doing a marriage conference a couple years ago, and in this particular workshop on sex, we were talking about how mutuality should play out in the bedroom. And our feeling is that, you know, sex needs to be mutual. There can't be any... um, you know, pressure or coercion that comes into the bedroom because that just ruins everything. So we were talking about this and Christopher made this comment, something something to the effect of that when a husband demands or expects sex from his wife, whenever he wants it as a, like an obligation from her, that it's going to be hurtful. And chances are, she's not going to be very enthusiastic about being sexually intimate, quite frankly. And he finished that sentence didn't even take a breath. And a young man, I don't know, late 20s, early 30s, grabbed his wife's hand and stormed out of the session. 
And it was impossible not to notice that moment. (laughs) And later he wrote on the evaluation for that workshop that I'm the man and I can demand sex whenever I want it. And it's her responsibility to give it to me. Now that might be an extreme example, but it might not be an extreme example. Um, But obviously he was not taking into consideration what her needs were, what her values were, what sex could be like for her. So those of us who are committed to seeing each other as equals, I think prioritize mutual flourishing. Like we really want to make the kind of sacrifices that allow our spouse to to flourish. And that's organic. It's fluid. You know, it changes from season to season. And and it's really important for us to be aware of the fact that, you know, equality isn't a concept. It's, It's a way of life that requires enormous sacrifices, enormous humility, and just ongoing communication so that we can be deeply in touch with each other and each other's needs. So I don't, I don't know if that's, if that offers any clarity or if that's still too muddy. No, it certainly does. I think that in the post purity culture world, at least we're hoping it's post purity culture at this point, but I think some people are still kind of in that world, but a lot of people I think are disentangling from that at this Mm -hmm. point. And, um, And so there is a lot more conversation being brought out about it. And so that gives a lot more clarity. You know, there's a lot of people that have this idea of headship and there's a lot of theological stuff written about that Mm -hmm. and how that word can get misinterpreted in English and and, and all the, the origins of the word. But I think that your answer is really important because it does, it affects both decisions. It affects how the marriage plays out in terms of gender roles, who does what it affects Mm -hmm. who can work, who can't work. It affects so many different layers. And um, and so you definitely touched on that in your answer. I know that probably several people, as they just heard you say that, are now going to go out and try to buy your books, <laughs> which is really what I was hoping for. Uh, yeah, because you kind of unpack a lot of how that can play out. There's just so many nuances of it. It's not a really short answer. It, it really affects so many things. But in the end, it's about respecting one another and loving each mm-hmm. other and you know, understanding we're both made in God's image. And there's a lot in Genesis that really is very meaningful to me about how Eve yes. was created as an Ezer warrior, right. not as a help meet as it was so right. badly translated. But I was in, um, in Scotland, uh, for my 25th wedding anniversary in, uh, early June. And we went to church of the Holy rood, which is where King James was coronated as a baby, 10 months old. And they oh. had the King James Bible there. And I spoke to the tour guide and she was, um, talking about how like the translation, how it was hard, it was kind of difficult for women and how King James had women issues and his own mother, Mary Queen of Scots was not allowed to be at the coronation and never actually saw him again. She was held captive. So he had a lot of mommy issues, a lot of things going on. But when you read all that was surrounding and Dr. Beth Allison Barr has written quite a bit about that, Mm -hmm. uh, King James and how that was so badly translated, you know, women were created as equals um, in Genesis and all throughout scripture and the way Jesus treated them. So why wouldn't our marriages be the same? So um, thank you for that answer. I really hope people kind of dig more deeply into that in your book. The next question I wanted to ask is there's a lot we mentioned earlier, Gen Z in particular is dealing with higher levels of anxiety than we've seen in other generations for a lot of reasons, COVID pandemic, but even things leading up to that social media and how it plays into things and all of it. But as marriages start to navigate suffering, trauma, loss, and a lot of difficulty, I know that you've written quite a bit about this. And so how can marriages walk through these difficult times in a way that is helpful to each other and to ourselves as individuals? Yeah. And I think we all have had way too much trauma, way too much suffering, way too much loss in the past two and a half years in particular. I mean, it just has felt like loss upon loss upon loss for many of us. Um, I guess my sense is that, you know, true trauma, such as experiencing ongoing racism, being the victim of a crime, um, witnessing an act of violence, being in a car crash, those kind of things, that they probably will require us to get professional help. Uh, going for, for pastoral counseling or talking with a friend will help for sure because it allows people to know us and to support us. But trauma is really deep and it's so complicated, even how the memories of the trauma get stored in our brain and how difficult it is to access and then how we can dissociate. Um, all of those things are sort of above the pay grade of your average pastor, honestly. Yeah. So I, I, we strongly recommend going for uh, professional help to, to process through trauma 
and then just being aware that it's not like a one and done, you know, that this sometimes takes years and years and years to really process through, to really integrate the trauma, to not be triggered, to not have PTSD all the time. Um, you know, one of the drums my husband and I always beat is when you need help, get help. Like, mm. don't let your shame get in the way. Don't let other people's opinions of you get in the way. Don't let your resources, to some extent, right, get in the way. Uh, reach out for the kind of help that you need and keep reaching out until you feel like you're in a better place. And I'm not sure I understand why there continues to be a stigma in the United States and maybe particularly in the church um, that ostracizes people when they're weak or when they say they need help. You know, there's something yeah. about our culture that just so values strength and independence that when we're in a difficult place, it can make us feel like there's something wrong with us as opposed to, you no, know, we're just human and we're in a place where we need help. We need sustenance. We need nurturing in this time. And when you look at, you know, the developmental model, God made us to be needy, right? Mm -hmm. We are the, we are the only mammal who needs parental help for such an extended period of yeah. time. Everybody else is out there much more quickly than we are. And we are, you know, we cannot survive literally without the help of our parents, which says to me that God means for need to be something that draws us into relationship rather than isolates us. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of losses and pain, I think that we really need to be patient with each other. We need to be connected, really bonded with each other so that we can understand what's happening. What are you going through right now? Um, you know, I write some about, it didn't go into great detail, but about 10 years ago, uh, we had just had a really, really difficult season where the church that we had been part of, my husband was on staff for 15 years, just blew apart as we watched it. And we felt like we had to leave for our own health and integrity um, in that same season, Christopher's mother died very quickly from pancreatic cancer. Our oldest son went off to college. We got bed bugs from the hotel that we stayed in on the way home from dropping oh, him off at college. And our neighbor, who was just a, an amazing, wonderful person, fell off of um, the deck and broke his neck and died. So this is oh, all gosh. like in an eight week period. And it just felt so overwhelming Um and because both of us had been deeply impacted by this, it was really difficult for us to support each other because we both, you know, felt like we were just holding on to the edge of the mountain. And all we could do is like look over at each other and say, you know, I still love you, but I can't really help you right now. So just encouraging each other, you know, to take time that we needed to have less, ex fewer expectations of each other. The house was a disaster in that season. Um, so we were working hard to try to make sure that we got the help that we needed, the support that we needed, and that we were just routinely having, you know, conversations with each other, praying for each other. And, and maybe the most important thing in that season was that we were trying to offer each other comfort and empathy, right? Because we can't, we couldn't fix anything, yeah. but we could deeply empathize with each other. And when we can empathize with each other, it just helps us to feel so much less lonely, you know, when we feel like this person is really here with me, they are really tracking with what's going on with me. They're checking in, you know, maybe the, the hug lasts an extra 10 seconds in the morning. Those very little things can help us to communicate to each other. I'm here. I might not be able to fix this, but I'm here and I'm loving you as best as I can. And I think that those things really help us to get through those seasons. Such good advice. Yes. And I, I just, that one little part where you said your house was a mess in that season, I want us to just emphasize that because that was, um, if you, I, so Laura Smith, she's a good friend. Uh, she and her husband, Steve Smith were kind of like marriage mentors for us for a little while when my twins were just babies and we had just moved to Singapore. I had a five-year-old and then two-year-old, two, year two one-year-olds, the twins and, uh, her, they had just become empty nesters and had raised three mm -hmm. boys and, um, I'm actually about to do a call with her later this week just to catch up. But she told me when she came over one time and I apologized for toys being on the ground or something like that. And we were just going through so many things, um, dealing with all of the work in Southeast Asia at mm -hmm. a high level. And, <laughs> and she, when I said that, she was like, if your house was perfectly clean, I would have been like, 
you you wasted time doing that. You have so many more important things to be doing right now with life the way that it is. Like yeah. there will be a time when houses can be clean, but this is not the time. You need to focus your energy on more important things. And I just – it really freed me up as a young yeah. mom for somebody to say that. There are just seasons where – please don't focus on that because you're probably not doing everything yeah. God's asked you to do. <laughs> and even, you know, maybe pulling out of ministry situations. For many of us, ministry is part of our lives and we really value it. It's a wonderful place uh, for us to connect. But in that season, um, I pulled out of almost all ministry stuff because I thought I can't just keep going as if life is fine. Like I need yeah. to be able to take care of myself and to have a little bit higher boundaries in this season. Good call. Yeah, good call. I know, um, you know, for certain personalities, it might just be like you need a little more alone time to think, to withdraw into your thoughts or your withdraw into your feelings or whatever that looks like for you. That's that's where I find the Enneagram quite helpful because it shows us where to go in health Mm -hmm. and where to go when we're stressed, you know. And so we start seeing our signs and stress of going toward that number. It's like, oh, yeah, probably I should rearrange some things because of what's happening in my life right now. And so that's really good advice. Um, you know, in addition to just trauma, that might just be little things. I know you talk a lot in your writing about how just dealing with little annoyances in marriage (laughs) is just sort of a common thing. What is your advice on marriages and the little annoyances that we each bring with our own personalities into the marriage? (laughs) So I just last week read a new book. This is how your marriage ends. And I am not remembering the name of the author. It's a man. Um, I, I wouldn't recommend it, but his essential premise is it's the, the little annoyances add up. They become big things. And what the, what we can far too easily conclude is that our spouse is not listening to us. They don't care about us. Uh, they don't value the things that are important to us. And, and I think that for that regard, but you know, that could have been a 800 word article. So he didn't need a 350 page book to flesh that out. Anyway. Um, So just this week, I had a conversation with my husband that we have had, I can't even tell you how many times in the 31 years that we've been married, about two of his habits that drive me crazy. One is that he leaves his shoes in front of the door where I go out. And um, I don't know, five or six years ago, I fell and broke my leg. It wasn't because of his shoes, but that was all part (laughs) of, you know, getting out the door. So I'm particularly sensitive now to please don't leave your shoes in front of the door. The other little thing that he does is that he will leave his dirty dishes on the um, counter 10 inches above the dishwasher, but not put them in the dishwasher, which he's a really competent person. He's very sensitive. He has a high emotional IQ. And I just think, why can you not do this for me? Right. Um, It's maddening. And we all have those little things. And he could tell you, he could tick off 10 things about me too. So it's not like I'm the virtuous one here. (laughs) <laughs> but neither of these habits are immoral. Um, they're annoying, but they're not immoral. But what I can conclude is, particularly if I'm under-resourced, is that um, he doesn't listen to me. He doesn't care about me. He, you know, values his own needs over my own, my needs, etc. And those sort of big picture conclusions are so unhelpful. Right. They really get us into bad spaces. We end up feeling the assuming the worst about our significant other as opposed to believing the best about them. So I think that we have had to process these kind of things a lot because, again, we are so different. But I think that when these annoyances surface, it's helpful to communicate our preferences because they are mostly preferences. Again, we're not, you know, there's nothing in the scripture that talks about not leaving your shoes in front of the door. Although that would have been really nice. Yes. So we have to communicate our preferences without moralizing, without saying, I'm a better person than you because I don't leave my shoes in front of the door. And that's, you know, my tendency. And maybe that's an Enneagram one. I don't know. We have to exhibit grace with our spouse's limitations. Part of what's hard for Christopher is um, he has ADHD. So he is very in the moment. But then in transitions, he really struggles. And it's Mm. in those moments of coming in the house and you know, that's a transition moment. Where do I leave my stuff? Well, I'll just leave it right here. Um, the, the, those, those are hard moments for him. So we, I understand that. And then I have to choose to give him grace in that space of limitation. But I also think that it's helpful for us to honestly call each other when, you know, there's a sin involved, when there's selfishness involved. 
um, again, not like the, we're the authority and we're the ones, one who always gets it right, but to be able to say, you know what, I think that there's a little bit of selfishness. I'm not quite sure that you can just attribute that to ADHD. And then forgive again and again. And then we just repeat the process <laughs> until the behavior changes or God calls us home. Right? <laughs> um, to some extent, maybe we could say that we have to hone the art of overlooking. Because again, these things should not be marriage breakers. They become marriage breakers if we um, put more weight on them than they should have, if we make moralizing judgments about our spouse. Uh, and But I also want to say that in that space, like we never want to be overlooking amoral behavior. We never want right. to be looking at abusive behavior. Like those things absolutely have to be addressed. They have to be called out um, and they shouldn't be, we shouldn't have to deal with them at all. So if that's happening, like my advice would never be, well, you just need to pray more and you need to be more gracious and you need to forgive him. I would think like, no, you need to be safe. And if that means getting out, you need to get out. So just want to be clear about that. Yeah, no, I'm glad that you ended on that. Let's let's dig a little deeper into that particular part because there may be women and men listening and they have been in maybe faith-based systems that especially in very hierarchical complementarian yeah. spaces where women are really expected to overlook everything. And right. that does include abusive behavior. Um, but also there are men who may have been so gaslit by maybe a narcissistic wife. Um, mm -hmm. And they have always just sort of overlooked really, really hard abusive things from that end. And so how can somebody tell the difference between what's an annoyance and what is really just a very toxic, abusive thing that should be brought to either the authorities or to a counselor or to a pastor or someone? Well, I think it's important to note that sometimes they start out as annoyances and then they gradually move towards things that are abusive or are truly toxic. And we, you know, there's certain ways to, to talk about this. Um, you don't want ever any blocking exits, for example, any hair pulling, any kind of physicality where one person is threatening or domineering um, another that like bad those are red flags. Uh, swearing, using demeaning or demoralizing language toward the other person, those are all indicators that it's an abusive situation. Um, when one spouse is not listening to the other, when they're making choices where they continually take power away, whether that's financial power or the power to make decisions, uh, limiting people's relationships with folks who um, you know, one spouse might feel it is unsafe, but really it's just a, a way for somebody to get support. Uh, those are all indicators that things are amiss and that really like you need to seek help as quickly as possible because there's the potential that there will be that proverbial moment where somebody will snap and then, you know, something horrific could happen. And I, I don't want to you know, forecast that for anybody, but I also don't want to minimize the fact that these things happen. You know, domestic violence is a thing. And in the past two and a half years, the rates have skyrocketed for domestic violence. Um, I think it can be a very shameful thing to admit, particularly maybe in Christian circles, that there's this kind of abuse happening. But if the offended party, and it's typically the wife, sometimes it's, it's a man, but oftentimes it's the wife because she is more vulnerable. If she chooses to keep quiet, it's not only going to be soul killing for her, but it's going to affect her children as well. Pretty much every marriage uh, we've worked with where there has been abuse, the kids are deeply, deeply affected by what, what's happening because they see it, they hear it, they're aware of uh, something being amiss. So there's a way in which I feel like Gosh, if there's anything that uh, the church could do better, it would be to support couples in marriage when they're when something like this is happening, like to destigmatize. We have a problem. We're not doing well, you know, and and to offer the kind of support and help that couples would need to get back into a healthy place. Yes, I totally agree, and those are good red flags to notice. I think um, when a spouse is completely isolating you from your relationships and your friendships, that's a huge red flag. Yeah. Um, to because there are people who you know want to break down your inner and your outer world in order to control right. you, and that right. is just not that's not an annoyance. That's along the lines of abusive, and yes. and just like you said, people like that have often gone to a pastor or a church leader, and because of, you know, the scripture that says God hates divorce, that mm -hmm. is not taken in with the whole counsel of scripture, which is that God would never want someone to be 
um, unsafe and abused in their own marriage. And so finding ways to help people get safe and navigate through that with good right. counseling and, in, you know, in some cases involving the local authorities, if that's yes. what's happening. Yeah. But right. often the church has really just, really just not done a good job with that in certain circles because of the image management of not wanting people to right. see what's going on and, and um, then they become a part of sort of the gaslighting and the yes. grooming that's already happening. And that that's really sad. So I do hope that people are starting to understand more of what is appropriate if you're a pastor listening or a church leader, just to be more trauma informed. I think if all of our church staff could just become trauma informed, they would understand better how to help people in these situations. So yeah, and even just really listening well, like if you're having a conversation with someone where they're expressing uh, that things aren't going well in the marriage to really listen and to really pay attention to any signals that they might be getting, because if they're together with their spouse, they might not be free to say, you know, this guy is actually beating me, but they might be giving hints that then uh, when, if you could find some time to be alone with that spouse and to say, I sort of got the idea that something was going on more than what you were able to say. Do you want to talk about that? Um, and not only giving them an opportunity to talk about that in a safe space, but we have to be as, you know, we have to be ready to say you and your kids can come stay with us. Like if there, if there really is imminent danger, we can't just say, oh, we'll pray for you. And here's the name of a counselor. Like we may actually need to say you can come stay with us as long as you need to stay with us because we value your safety. Yeah, such a good point. And so often there's not bruises to show anything. Right. If it's psychological, emotional abuse or financial abuse, they may not have a credit card in their name where they could go to a hotel or, right. um, you know, they're, they're looking at being homeless and living in poverty if they leave or, right. you know, um, or just being afraid they'll be found. It's hard to hide and knowing where they would go. And so some people stay for that reason. But yeah, being more sensitive, I think for all of us who, um, who care about people in our communities, but also in our faith-based spaces is really important. Thanks for sharing those. Yeah. Um, so here, just one last question as we're trying to sort of wrap up. Um, if you had just uh, couples of, you know, different age groups, so like we mentioned earlier, the engaged couple, mm -hmm. um, but also we have people in mid-marriage that you've written to, and then people at the end, you know, at different levels of marriage, people might have unmet expectations. It might be unmet expectations as you're planning the wedding, or it might be unmet mm -hmm. expectations in midlife, or it may be that you're getting toward your end of your life and you realize that there's a, a huge unmet expectation of your entire marriage together. Um, how can marriages deal with something that heavy? And what is your advice to people? You know, the, the idea of expectations is so fascinating to me. And I think that we don't talk about it nearly enough. Um, and I think that it, it can be underneath of or fueling the marital conflicts that many of us have, as well as the disappointments that we carry. So like annoyances, unmet expectations uh, can be highly consequential and can lead to uh, the failure of a marriage if, if we don't navigate it well. I think that similar to what we talked about or touched on briefly with regard to complementarian versus egalitarian marriages, we have to parse out which expectations that we have are non-negotiable and are holy and are good and are in imperative for us to have a healthy marriage, such as fidelity and honesty, right? Like we don't want to shrug our shoulders for those and just say, oh, well, you know, I guess that's not going to happen. We need to fight for those expectations. However, many of our expectations reflect our personal preferences um, and emerge from our personality types, the family we grew up in, the culture at large. And, and I'll give you just two quick examples from our marriage. One is that Christopher is a time optimist. Are you familiar with that term? I can imagine what it is. <laughs> So he lives as if time is a metaphor. You know, time is very fluid. He's very, as I mentioned before, very in the moment. So if you are his first counseling appointment of the day, you will just get like amazing attention, attentiveness, focus. If you are the wife waiting for him at the end of the day, <laughs> chances are he might be late because he has not been able to, you know, realize time actually does pass. Um, so that has been, particularly in the first 10 years of our marriage, a huge issue for us. Like I come from Northern Europe. My expectation, like if you travel, you know, where are the clocks on the outside of the buildings? 
England, right? England, Germany, like very yeah. time, time centric places. So my expectation was um, you're on time. Like if you say you're going to be here at six o'clock, you're going to be here at six o'clock. And when he wasn't, there wasn't just irritation, frustration, anger. I moralized. And, you know, though his offense was like a two, I felt like I responded as if it was an eight. Um, so those areas of conflict, routine conflict that we have, we should stop and to say, what's the expectation that one of us might be carrying in the situation? And how can we determine how to process it, how to negotiate it, how to compromise over it? Uh, another expectation that I had coming into marriage was about romance. So, you know, I am a product of the 1960s Disney movies. And if you think <laughs> about those movies, there's this very particular theme of the woman who sings, who waits, who, you know, pines away for her man. And then the man comes and sweeps her off, off her feet, takes her away from all the difficult things and life is happily ever after. Yeah. Well, that's not, you know, we all know that's not how life works, but I mean, I'm sort of shocked that I didn't realize this, but that is indeed how I came into marriage with the expectation of what romance looked like. Now, Christopher feels like romance in that nature is um, sentimental and he wants nothing to do with that. So I was expecting him to express his love to me in one particular way. He was expressing it in another way, but because he wasn't meeting the expectation I had, I was disappointed which was really unfortunate because he does love me and he does demonstrate that he loves me. But I had these preformed ideas that had to be deconstructed so that I could receive from him what he wanted to give me. So there's a level of self-awareness that we need to have. We need to be able to say, I'm feeling disappointed. If I'm feeling disappointed, what was, the, how does that connect to an expectation that I had? And then growing in our capacity to understand which of those expectations um, do we need to make compromises on? Which ones can I say, you know what, that's not really that important. Um, which ones need to be fought for? Which ones uh, would God have us continue to fight for? And I think that so much of, like it's that kind of nitty gritty stuff that is so much of, of, of what, what it means to be married, right? Is how can we live out the kind of love that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 13? I mean, it's a really high calling when you look at that, um, but I think that that is, in fact, what God is inviting us to do, is to love our spouse, who is our most enduring neighbor, um, with the best of our ability, empowered by God for the entirety of our lives. It's a holy calling, and it's a hard calling. But I think that when we succeed in doing it, we bring God's kingdom into our marriage, and we become agents of healing for each other. And that is really beautiful. It is really beautiful. Thank you so much, Dorothy, for showing us how marriage can be beautiful. We're going to let people know about your books in the show notes so they can find them. But if people just want to find, because I know you've written a lot of articles and um, are just a writer for a lot of different spaces. So how can people find you and more about your writing and what you're putting out there? Yeah, if you go to my website, which is dorothygreco.com, uh, you will find places to sign up for my monthly newsletter. I'm writing on Substack. And then whenever I have an article that appears in some other publication, I typically list it there. So that's that's probably the best. You can also follow me on Instagram. I'm reluctantly and sporadically on Twitter, um, but I do show up there sometimes. Thank you so much, Dorothy. This has been an incredible conversation that's been enlightening for me. And I just appreciated you uh, giving me a couple of copies of your books. I know we're going to try to do a giveaway. So we'll talk about that too and put that in the show notes. So Great. thank you for just your generosity today to help us get better together at marriage wherever we are. It's been an honor to have you on. Yeah. Well, I hope you enjoyed that very Bye. enlightening conversation with Dorothy. We have a giveaway going on. So we have two copies of each of her books that we mentioned here today on this podcast. Uh, the first book is Marriage in the Middle, Embracing Midlife Surprises, Challenges, and Joys, which is her most recent book from 2020. And then her previous book, Making Marriage Beautiful, Lifelong Love, Joy, and Intimacy, Start With You. And she has a contribution from her husband, Christopher Greco, in that book, too. So we have two copies to give away of each of those books. So if you'll go to our Instagram and our Facebook, you will see um, at a world of difference, it's all linked in the show notes, how to enter into the giveaway. And she will directly mail you in the U.S. addresses only, unfortunately, um, 
a copy of each of those books, whichever one you win. And I also wanted to make sure everybody knew that she also has a premarital workbook resource that's available. If you go to DorothyGreco.com slash books, you'll see that it's called Start Strong. So I definitely wanted you guys to know about that. If any of you know somebody or a couple that are thinking of getting married and going through premarital conversations. It's a great resource that that she also sent to me and I was able to look through. It's called Start Strong. Once again, I will link that in the show notes for you to have access to that to send to anybody that you know that's in premarital counseling or is engaged right now. It's just a highly recommended resource. You may be like many people out there who you may be like an evangelical Christian. You may be mainline Christian. You may be new to Christianity, you may have been raised in a Christian family, you may be Muslim or Jewish or Buddhist or Hindu or have no faith that you profess or religion that you practice. And all of that is still welcome in terms of reading these books because if you are a person who is married or wants to understand more about marriage or is thinking of getting married or dating, these resources that Dorothy provides are just excellent because I think a lot of us who, uh, speaking for the, I would say American white evangelical community in particular, a lot of us have gone to Christian bookstores over time and the majority of books you're going to find there about marriage are much more complementarian in perspective. So a lot of the egalitarian resources have been more academic in nature and we discuss that a lot more in depth on our Women in the Church podcast that we did last year. So uh, you probably, if you've been with us for a while here at the Our World of Difference podcast, have heard us talk about this a bit. But uh, some other podcast episodes, if you want to kind of research back into those in the Women in the Church podcast, we had uh, different speakers that spoke about this. We had Dr. Beth Allison Barr on the show, who has written a book that's very famous called The Making of Biblical Womanhood. She came on the show and she was just releasing that book. And also we have uh, had other authors and speakers who have spoken about this, maybe not directly, but just in terms of uh, they are egalitarian. Um, and that's a part of their other works that we may not have discussed in their books, and that would be Dr. Scott McKnight, even though he was on talking about a church called Tove, he's an egalitarian and has, or or maybe calls himself a mutualist, I'm not sure, but along the lines of um, the equality of men and women in a marriage relationship and the lack of hierarchy there in terms of his understanding. But also um, we had, um, you know, if you've checked out the Junia Project, some of you have learned about that through this podcast. And we have discussed their resources as a great place to start in terms of a lot of articles. But if you listen to the episode where we had, um, pastor Kate Wallace Nunley, who she and her mom both have been the ones who started the junior project. Um, if you'll check out episode 23, we talk a little more in depth about how, really a lot of the marriage books out there have been for quite some time more scholarly in nature and not really many of them available to people in the pews, just your average kind of churchgoer. And so, um, but we wanted to point these marriage books to you from Dorothy because she's one of many who's writing for just your average churchgoer and your average person and not keeping it to academic. However, if you want more academic, there's plenty of resources around that. And I would point you to the Junior Project. But also, we had Dr. Mimi Haddad on, who's the president of Christians for Biblical Equality. And she's also an egalitarian scholar, episode 49. Many of you loved and listened to. And so please check that out if you haven't heard that before. And then also Dr. Graham Hill, episode 31, writes about his book, Holding Up Half the Sky, which is a much more concise and readable and less scholarly and academic book around egalitarian uh, relationships between men and women, both in marriage and in ministry. Um, And so even though he is an academic in Australia and has written many books, his book, Holding Up Half the Sky, we discussed uh, when it was first coming out on episode 31. So it's a lot more readable for people. And yeah, so once again, check out our Women in the Church series if you have not. if If this is 
caused you to want to dig a little deeper. I know there's a lot going on on Twitter lately around complementarianism and egalitarianism. Some people prefer to use the phrase mutuality or mutualist. Really, the wording kind of gets a little crazy sometimes, but I think that as we are learning together and trying to restore both marriage and the church, that these conversations are extremely important. Um, And then also, I just wanted to put out a little plug here (laughs) for Justice Revival, which is something I'm on the board of and recently joined along with Lisa Sharon Harper. She and I are the two new board members, and we had a retreat recently in Washington, D.C., and One of the things that we're working on with Justice Revival is to help in the United States to pass the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment for Women. And so if this conversation has made you want to not only join the giveaway for the books, but also want to take a step of action even further, please check out Justice Revival. I will link that in the show notes so you can find out more. We have a hashtag Faith for ERA campaign. And if you would just like to contribute money toward the effort, or if you want to learn more from the resources or both, there are webinars once in a while that happen. There's initiatives where we ask people to sign, um, send in, you know, a postcard to the U.S. archivist to help ratify the ERA, which has been around for 50 years now and still has not been ratified. But it's one of the things that, especially in a post-Roe United States, is something many of us in the faith community are really wanting to help push more for women who are going to be having these babies we're asking them to have passing the equal rights amendment would be very helpful to help them have all the things that women don't have guaranteed um we still don't have equal pay for equal work and all kinds of um rights human rights that that are guaranteed to men in the united states but not to women and to girls that are coming up too so yeah i'll link that in the show notes to justice revival and if you have any questions around that please please reach out to me. I'd love to tell you more about it because I really enjoy working with Justice Justice Revival as a board member and the great work that's going on there. So also follow Justice Revival on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook so you can learn more about that. But once again, it'll be in the show notes. Thank you everyone for listening. As we try to restore relationships between men and women, marriages, faith communities, especially in the church, which has uh, a lot of restoration needed right now. I'm just so glad you joined us for this conversation. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for being a part of this community and for making a difference together wherever you are around the world. As we're finishing this episode, if you're thinking, I really wish I could learn more or go a little bit deeper. Well, that's what our Difference Maker community is for. I would love to welcome you in to join the rest of us there. Once again, um, it's only $5 a month to join the price of a latte at your local coffee shop. You can join at our Changers tier. Difference Makers is a community that really means so much to me. It's very special because each time I have a guest on the show, I record something um, outside of what we give to just the regular podcast audience where we go a little bit deeper and then I post those video episodes in this community and we can discuss them. But also at the very uh, beginning tier, which is our changers tier of this community, you'll get exclusive voting power and help pick podcast topics that give us you know, more of what we want from your perspective. You'll have access to exclusive um, 30 plus mini sods that aren't out there for the general public. And you'll get every month an exclusive monthly bonus mini sode. At our groundbreakers level, which is $10 a month, you can join and get all of that, but also priority access to submit questions to the podcast. And you'll get an additional two exclusive monthly bonus mini sods. And at our Trailblazers tier, which is $15 a month, the price of three lattes a month, um, you can get all of that plus also three exclusive monthly bonus minisodes um, and a patron shout out. So I would love for you to join us at any of those tiers. Um, It'll help you come into this community, be in the midst of all of us, other difference makers, and we'd love to hear your perspective. I certainly would. It's a place to engage more with me and the audience around what you like, what you're resonating with, and once again, go deeper with each of our guests. So please join us in this membership community. I would love to hear your perspective and love to share this extra content with you. So show up at patreon.com slash a world of difference. 